Let us cultivate the altruistic motivation seeking complete enlightenment for the sake of liberating infinite kind mother sentient beings with that kind of bodhicitta motivation that we should all participate in this teaching. Historically speaking, uh, Shakyamuni, after he uh, became a complete enlightened uh, being called Buddha, so we call him Buddha Shakyamuni, our historical teacher, uh, he gave uh, uh, three uh, major teachings, uh, traditionally called uh, Three Turnings of the Will of Dharma. And the reason behind doing that is in order to uh, help us sentient beings uh, to uh, follow the path that helps us to be free from uh, the two types of uh, mental obscuration obscuration to nirvana or liberation and obscuration to omniscient uh, uh, wisdom. So if we ask why had the Buddha teach uh, so many different things, or in other words, why couldn't he you know, talk about only one thing and then you know, let that be the case? Uh, the rationale behind uh, numerous teachings that Buddha gave or discourses involves that we as sentient beings have uh, different mental dispositions, interests, capacities, and abilities. So in order to suit our dispositions and capacities, Buddha taught uh, many different uh, 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 dharma. Did you come to some of my Considering the different uh, mental aptitudes and uh, capacities of uh, different uh, uh, beings, uh, Buddha uh, talked about uh, three different types of uh, bodhi, now bodhi translated as enlightenment. Uh, Buddha talked about uh, bodhi or the enlightenment of uh, uh, hearers or shirvakas. So we usually call nirvana or liberation, but we use the term enlightenment in this case here. Then at a higher level, if you so to speak, 
but I talked about uh, enlightenment of uh, solitary realizers or what is called Pratyeka Buddhas, another level of enlightenment. And then he taught finally uh, the what are called the enlightenment of bodhisattvas or the Mahayana. Uh, because uh, you know different uh, practitioners have different uh, aptitudes and capacities, and therefore Buddha taught those three different levels of enlightenment, if you will, and also taught you know complete structure of the paths leading to these different uh, states of enlightenment. No. <laughs> So when we look at ourselves, uh, we are a group of people with different uh, mental aptitudes and capacities. And uh, so we can find uh, different uh, I mean, levels of uh, dharma or discourses and practice. You know, we can uh, go and start with a basic or simple form of practice. Uh, we can do intermediate level <coughs> kind of practice, and we can do advanced level practice. You know, each of us could, you know, start with simple things, if you will, basic, and then we can uh, progress on to other levels and do other, uh, you know, types of uh, spiritual practice. So that's what we talk <coughs> about, uh, spiritual development or spiritual growth. Oh, no. That is any... That's ตํากะชิคอเลทาร์คอตาคอเลทาร์กอเรทอคอเลทาบะซินดึกยามาเรนี่อ่าฮีจิเดบะปังนี่ฮีจิเดบะปังกอเรเจซาตาเนี่ย
and then meditate, cultivate, you know, insight into these meanings through meditational practice, then we are able to affect our state of mind. We can purify our mind of the mental obscurations, and that's how we grow spiritually and we liberate ourselves from, uh, you know, uh, from delusions as well as obscuration to omniscient uh, knowledge. <laughs> So this is the bottom line, what I'm trying to get across to you. That we could be reciting mantras, we could be doing prayers, uh, or other things, but our motivation should be, and we should understand that, reciting mantra is uh, to be used as an antidote to counteract our diluted states of mind, okay, our mental obscurations. Praying is good, but the purpose of praying is to use it as an antidote to counteract our negative states of mind. Yeah, because we need to bring about inner positive transformation, so therefore, recitation of mantras, you know, uh, reciting prayers, all of these things, what we do, what we call dharma, should be applied to our own state of mind as an antidote. The Tibetan term is nyenpo. Okay? Nyenpo has a sense of like, we use the dharma practice as an opposing forces to challenge and to diminish uh, our uh, negative states of mind. So whether we engage in the study of Dharma or listen to Dharma teachings, or whether we are contemplating uh, Dharma, or we are meditating on Dharma, doing the cultivating practice, what we really need to always keep in our mind is, whatever we are practicing, is it helping us to counteract our deluded states of mind? Are we able to diminish our delusions a teeny weeny bit? It's okay, a little bit. Or do we still see that it doesn't matter whatever we say we are practicing, our delusions are pretty much remain the same thing. There is no change, you know, they are just as you know, tough as they have ever been, you know. If that is the case, if we are not affecting delusions in our mind, negativities, then we are really not doing our practice properly. Are you with me? Okay, although we say I'm practicing Dharma, but the, the, the truth of the matter is that really we haven't been doing it properly because the delusions have remained as tough as they have ever been. We got to challenge our delusions in the mind and we got to affect some change, even if it's a little bit of you know, decrease in the delusion, that's fine, but we need to be uh, able to bring that kind of a change. So as I mentioned earlier, that when we talk about uh, spiritual uh, practice, you know, that seems like, you know, one thing, but it really isn't. It involves many levels of practice, and of course, it is a wise and intelligent and a common sense, if you will, thing to begin from a basic foundation practice and then we progress next to level. You know, don't start from somewhere else, you know, up there, but go to go to the basic and start from there and then go up. Yeah, so that's so first we try to understand, uh, you know, things based upon our own personal experiences. You know, we, each of us have gone through so many pains, problems, and suffering. Yeah? So we really want to understand the suffering that we have been through, and we truly develop the wish that I want to be free from the state of suffering. Okay? So once we 
have certain experience of that based upon our personal experiences, now we focus our mind on other people or sentient beings and we truly wish them to be free from the state of suffering, which is called compassion. See, first to develop compassion, we've got to understand ourselves, you know, that we don't want any kind of suffering and we want, you know, to uh, get rid of them. So when we know that, now based upon our own experiences, it seems like a shared experience as we have with others, now we understand that other people and beings don't want suffering. So now we truly wish them, right? Now we are not kind of a faking it, you know, we mean it because, you know, we know what it means based on experiences that to really wish others to be free from uh, suffering. Uh, the rank in Tai Yenji, Yenna, Sengi Yenna, never ship it, never even the Hako was shit. That Hako was shit. So, one of the basic things, if you will, uh, we need to keep in our minds that um, whatever problems and suffering that we ourselves have been through and that others have been through, all of these sufferings are the result of outcome of uh, negative karmic actions and harmful actions. So we may think that, you know what, in this life I haven't really, you know, hurt anyone or done anything negative, you know, but we got to keep in our mind that maybe in this life, you know, we have not done that, hopefully, or let's assume at least, you know, but then we have to look back in previous lifetimes and many other previous lifetimes we did, you know, hurt others and we did a lot of negativities. So the things, negative things that we experience in our life are the results of what we did in our past lives, the negative things we did in the past lives. So we have to be able to see that connection between suffering and negative karmas that we ourselves did, you know, in past lives. So as we, uh, you know, look at this matter, that all kinds of suffering that both myself and others have been through is related to negative karmas and uh, harmful actions. So once we really get a good sense of that, uh, and so now, you know, what kind of a conclusion we make out of that? If that is the case, okay, then it is rationally, you know, sound uh, to think that, okay, I'm not going to involve myself in negative karmas physically, verbally, and mentally. In other words, I will see that I'm not going to use my body, speech, and mind in, you know, doing something negative or hurting others. Hmm. Megivali <laughs> Uh, great Indian uh, sage philosopher Arya Nagarjuna Gompul Lurup has said, as Kesala quoted the lines from his memory, uh, all kinds of suffering has come about from negativities. But all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, peace, happiness, and goodness come from uh, positive uh, actions. So what he's really saying here is that unfortunate states of rebirth in the three bad migrations that we talk about in the hell, hungry ghost world, lesser kind of animal world, as well as a lot of the baggages that they have to carry, the sufferings, uh, are all outcomes of uh, negative karmic actions. Okay? Whereas the good rebirths, fortunate rebirths that we talk about, in the form of uh, human life, you know, the kind we are enjoying now, or uh, in a celestial world, and whatever pleasure and comforts and kind of happiness we enjoy, relatively speaking, in this life, are the outcomes of uh, positive uh, karmic actions. Yes.
So based upon these statements, the lessons we need to carry in our everyday life is that now whatever I'm doing, I'm walking, I'm sitting, I'm standing, I'm moving, whatever I'm doing, you try to cultivate positive attitudes, beneficial attitudes uh, for other sentient beings. You know, we try to cultivate the state of mind wishing others to be happy, wishing others to be free from suffering. Okay? And uh, so if we carry those, try to cultivate those attitudes, and at least if it means saying good prayers, you know, may I be able to bring happiness to others, may I be able to help sentient beings free from suffering, whatever actions we are doing in everyday life, I think that's, you see, that brings meaning into our life. So we are trying to cultivate uh, love and compassion in our everyday life for uh, other sentient beings. Oh, no. So those are some of uh, you know things I think uh, uh, we, we should all, including myself, uh, to bring to our mind and uh, you know uh, pay attention to this and think about this. And I'll go back to where we left off uh, in this wonderful text called. Uh, a miscellaneous collection of uh, Kadamba Geshe's uh, personal advices. <laughs> so now we are um, here uh, looking at what uh, a great Kadamba Geshe by the name of Geshe Podava. Uh, he uh, told a gathering of uh, you know disciples, not to some individual disciples, but a soyo means a gathering, at a gathering. So first thing he said that all sentient beings, sentient beings meaning those of uh, beings who have uh, deluded states of mind. That's the understanding of sentient beings. So every sentient being has got as many as 84,000 forms of delusion. Uh, the number is correct. Uh, 84,000, you know. Uh, and because of that, Buddha taught as many as 84,000 forms of discourses as antidotes to these 84,000 uh, uh, delusions. Mm. So Buddha taught uh, so much, 84,000 discourses, but we need to somehow kind of bring all things together. If we are going to summarize, essentialize Buddha's teachings, we can do it in two different ways, right? Because uh, we can do it in terms of, uh, so in maybe modern languages, editing the words so that too many words can be edited out and you bring, you know, uh, the, the number of words down is called Sigitiva. So you cut down so many words and bring down to the essence in terms of word presentation. Or we can summarize, which is mostly in terms of the meaning. You know, he taught so many things. What, you know, what is really trying to get, you know, across to us so we can summarize the meaning of the Buddha's teachings. <laughs> So, 
So in terms of uh, words of expression, if we talk about sum summary in terms of the words of expression, Sikhidiva, so Buddha taught so many things, but all of them are brought within what is called the three baskets of uh, you know, teaching, tripitikas in Sanskrit. There is what are called basket of uh, uh, ethics or moral discipline, Vinaya Pitika, Durvetenu in Tibetan. There is the basket of discourses or Sutra Pitika or Dodetenu. And then there is uh, the basket of uh, wisdom or knowledge, Abhidhamma Pitika or Mumbetenu. So within these three baskets, uh, for lack of a better, nicer term in English, <coughs> basket, but it's a Pitika. Uh, then we can bring all the words of expression of Buddha's, you know, teachings. Yes. Now, in terms of the meaning, all of Buddha's entire teachings can be uh, summed up in three, if you will, contents or subject matters. And there are the three higher trainings, Labasum, uh, training in higher ethics, uh, which is called Sudim Jilaba, Sudim Jilaba, training in higher concentration or Samadhi, thing is in Jilaba, and training in higher wisdom. Uh, and share up uh, in Tibet. So within these three higher trainings, these three subject matters, you know, are the real essence in terms of meaning of all the teachings uh, Buddha has given us. So these three higher trainings are not so much to be kind of memorized, but they are to be internalized because they constitute realizations. But then how do we realize this or cultivate in our mind if yes, how everything begins is education. We need to educate ourselves in three pitikas or the three baskets of teachings. So we need to educate ourselves in those teachings and then put it into practice and then experience, internalize the subject matter of uh, the three baskets, which are the three higher uh, trainings. So now, if the three higher trainings are to be internalized, actualized, cultivated within our state of mind. Uh, so which of the three higher trainings we should begin first, if you will? Okay. So we need to begin with training in what is called higher ethics. Okay. Shila, or the ethics, is where we begin. Because ethics constitute the foundation Based on that foundation, then we cultivate samadhi or concentration. So once we have ethics and samadhi or concentration, those two higher trainings, now based on those, we are able to cultivate training in higher wisdom. So training in higher wisdom is, so to speak, built onto the other two higher trainings. That this new member said in Pan Sanji Pains, this year to tell us the garrison, have a carriage of this, Ranju Shevina, T, have a carriage of love at T, new member to the Kiji to any Pani, Sanji Gomba Tober Race Ganando. And then an emphasis is made on training in high wisdom, and that in Tibet means day, that that only refers to the training in high wisdom that really helps us to get rid of or to counteract the two types of mental obscuration, delusions and obscuration to omniscient knowledge, and then we could become a complete enlightened person. 
Tena, therefore, you know, for those reasons, uh, we should begin with practice of training, uh, training in higher ethics, because that is the foundation practice to be able to cultivate the two other higher trainings. Uh, and uh, uh, so that if we would like to internalize the three higher trainings, we should build the foundation first, which is the practice of ethics, and then we could cultivate samadhi or concentration, and we can cultivate higher level of uh, wisdom. <laughs> So we as beginners should primarily focus on training in high ethics, and to be able to practice ethics, we need to be aware of and understand what are uh, what are called uh, uh, the um, I mean opponent uh, you know forces here. You know what are the things that could be obstacle. Uh, you know, uh, to cultivate uh, uh, ethics. Yeah. Uh, maybe I should, uh, uh, you know, first uh, tell you about uh, different levels or types of ethics. You know, we can talk about, uh, you know, ethics. Uh, uh, you know, which are, uh, how should you say, uh, uh, we, we, uh, which are related to lay practitioners who are not, uh, you know, ordained as monks and nuns. So we can talk about uh, lay practitioners' ethics. Then we can talk about ethics which are related to monastic ordinations as monks and nuns. Then we can talk about uh, bodhisattva ethics at a higher level. And then we can talk about uh, uh, tantric ethics or the Vajrayana ethics. So those are different types of the levels of ethics uh, that uh, you know uh, we could uh, uh, practice. No, no. Ta chimba ke se na mandu ta thamji ke sun gaya the. Chimba ina nda rajju ina thamji ke sun gaya the kar kya gaya se na mege chovu ko chhim the samalok sun gaya je res. So now there is, uh, in, so to speak, a basic level of ethics that everybody should keep it, whether we are monks or nuns, or no monks or nuns, you know, or just, uh, you know, regular people, lay people. There is what we call the ethics of abandoning ten negative actions of body, speech, and mind. Now that is a basic ethics which applies to one and all practitioners. Now, that's the correct thing to uh, maybe I should just quickly run through the ten uh, negative actions. Uh, uh, that we need to uh, abandon or get rid of, or uh, stop doing. Uh, there is uh, what are called um, ten negativities involved: not to kill, yeah, or not to take, you know, uh, uh, take a life. And uh, so this is a case where, like, when we develop sort of a commitment in our mind that I commit myself not to take the life of somebody, I'm not going to kill. Then it becomes an ethics, okay. And so in, in the case of a lay practitioner, let's talk about, so when you make that commitment in the mind, I'm not going to kill anyone, okay, or that I'm not going to uh, steal things which belong to others, and in the case of a lay person, I'm not going to indulge in uh, adultery, okay, we call sexual misconduct. Uh, so then you are keeping, uh, for example, the ethics related to 
you know, to abandon those three negativities. So those three negativities are related to our body, right, physical action. Okay, we may develop a commitment, I'm not going to kill, you know, someone, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to indulge in adultery as a lay person, then we are keeping the ethics of uh, physical, you know, activities. No. And then there are four negativities of the speech uh, that we need to, to abandon, and that's why ethics to abandon them. Uh, and the four negativities are, uh, you know, lying. So lying is a form of cheating. You know, you deceive others, you cheat others, uh, you know, verbally. So lying. And tama is causing disharmony or division, right? So you kind of cause disharmony among good friends so that they can never be friends, you know. Or that even if there's a possibility for becoming friend and you just, you know, uh, spoil the whole thing and say something and they can, you know, they divide, you know, we, we divide among peoples. Uh, harsh speech, unpleasant speech, unkind words, you know. Uh, and the last one, which I, I still don't know whether English captures really well, is we translate as idle gossiping. So basically, just talking much about, much ado about nothing. Yeah, you know, we think like we're talking something, there's really nothing there. Uh, and uh, what included in the idle gossiping is, you know, we kind of talk about, uh, for example, you know, um, Okay, uh, how can we kill someone? You just plan it all out, just talk about, discussion about how to kill someone or how to steal somebody's, you know, uh, things. And so those are considered as uh, useless, meaningless, part of idle gossiping. And those are considered as negativities. And then there are three negativities of uh, mind. Of course, we are talking only about three here, not that there are only three, you know. Uh, then we would be lucky, I think. Anyway, that's my footnote for today. Um, so there is what we call covetousness. We covet for the nice and good things that other people have. Ah, and he got it. I really want it for myself. You know, that, that coveting for others' good is a negative state of mind. And uh, harmful intent, nursing. So it could be very malicious. It could be like just wanting to harm someone or hurt someone. That is a negative uh, state of mind. And then there is what called wrong view or distorted view, lokta in Tibetan. Now the distorted views include a number of things. Uh, if uh, we, uh, how should you say, uh, deny uh, the um, outcomes of uh, law of karma and actions. You know, for example, we say, you know what? You know, the good karmas bringing good results and bad karmas bringing good results is all, you know, whatever. And it's totally denied that. So that kind of a denial constitutes a wrong view or distorted view. Or that if we say, you know what, this Dharma Sharma thing, you know, really it has nothing to do with. You know, we kind of underestimate and, uh, you know, cast aspersion onto the power of Dharma. Uh, would also be a distorted uh, view. Yes. 
So those are the ten negativities uh, uh, of body, speech, and mind, and we all need to, uh, uh, you know, abandon them. Whether we are lay practitioners or lay persons or monks or nuns, of course, uh, now I need to eat. Uh, I think food dog. In the case of uh, uh, this uh, adultery, which applies to the lay people, for the monks and nuns, it really means not to indulge in any kind of sexual activity. Okay, and so with that, you know, things that. All these ten negativities uh, are what we all need to uh, you know, abandon. No, no. And when we uh, commit ourselves to do that, then we are abiding by the ethics of abandoning the ten negative actions of body, speech, mind. That was a mouthful no, no. to say. And that regulation or regime, that any shampoo, 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 so then, of course, there are other higher-level, you know, ethics such as bodhisattva ethics and tantric ethics. You know, only those who, you know, who take them, you know, and then those are things that are relevant. And I don't think uh, I need to talk about those here. Then this one, the children of mental shown the child in bed. Children of mental show that children are never thinking, the never thinking carries them the charges, the charges can be eliminated. So remember, a little earlier we said we need to know what are the obstacles or opposing forces to cultivate ethics. And here is mentioned that a major obstacle is attachment, dosha. To be able to uh, observe or practice ethics, a major uh, hurdle that we need to cross over, if you will, is attachment. Uh, yes. So, so what makes us transgress our, you know, vows and commitments is the attachment, you know. So that's why it is a, it, it's a real culprit. Yes. Yes. Attachment is, uh, uh, is a very serious, uh, if you will, uh, delusion that we have. Of course, uh, at the, how should I say, core of us, there is what we call uh, ignorance, which is uh, the source of all other delusions. But after the ignorance, the next you know, level delusion, if you will, is attachment. So in that sense, many other delusions do arise from, or at least with the assistance of attachment. You know, so attachment is a good assistant to Mr. Ignorance. Sure, then this one was. Sure, you know, but then you saw in the Chinese one at the the Chinese carriers, na, ane rang le kepran zin berang kin zin ta, ane rang dadu dadu ta dang zin marik patel sungun was. And uh, you know, here the expression that is used is that. Uh, in a generic sense, uh, attachment is a source from which other delusions come about. Now, what do we really mean by what kind of attachment? Now, in this case, the term attachment is used, but it's to be understood more in terms of self-centeredness and self-grasping. You know, as we have talked a lot, you know, how all delusions arise from self-grasping and uh, selfishness or self-centeredness. Mm. Self-cherishing attitude, selfishness, self-centeredness is a kind, in some sense, a quite a, uh, is, is a form of attachment. You know, because of self-cherishing attitude, then we find ourselves, you know, uh, experience many other types of delusions and engage in uh, uh, negativities. No, no. That, the child attaining you know, what other sugar is, can also, that is sugar is, what is it, so, like motivated by attachment, or attachment as an underlying uh, kind of a motivation, we engage in uh, negative karmic actions, and then the, those leads to the suffering outcomes, you know. So if we want a formula, you know, then this is like attachment plus the negativity is equal to suffering. Uh, uh, great uh, Tibetan master Manjushri Lama Tsongkhapa or Jerumbuche, uh, who is sitting over next to me here in the center, said 
uh, that uh, attachment is uh, that which really binds us to samsara. You know, if we think that what binds us within samsara, you know, what is holding us here, it is attachment. Mm. So it is the current of, metaphorically speaking, it is the current of uh, attachment that kind of uh, throws us into the ocean of samsara. So, um, the most important uh, delusion that we need to fight with and get rid of uh, is uh, grasping at self or self grasping, you know, which is also understood in this case as attachment, you know. So our two main, uh, you know, delusions to get rid of are self-grasping and self-cherishing attitude. So as we understand that self-cherishing attitude is uh, a main source of so many other delusions and suffering, we should also try to understand that cherishing other sentient beings is a main source of uh, you know, goodness, peace and happiness. Uh, so we are going to stop there a little bit early today because uh, we have a number of uh, people uh, who have taken what is called one day Mayana precepts. So their precepts involve, you know, having to eat uh, just one time meal before noon. Yes, yeah, so we are cooperating with them and supporting their practice. Oh, I have prayer requests uh, here. No. Um, so we have, um, you know, three people uh, who have passed away. Now, excuse me if I don't say the names right, you know. But actually, people don't say my names right either, so it's okay. Uh, I'm called Mr. Dor here, you know, figure that one out. Uh, Johanna, you know, Molchon passed away. Kazu Jason passed away. Uh, Tia McKinney's passed away. Uh, so three people are no more with us. And John, how do you say the last name? Whoever wrote it? Back surgery. Huh? Or Shlatek. That's it. Oh, no. okay. uh, back surgery on Monday. So prayers are requested for all of them. Oh, no. Omanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomanebemomaneb
happiness, prosperity, and spirituality. Last but not least, we dedicate our collective uh, positive energy for all kind mother sentient beings to be free from the fears and dangers of two types of mental obscuration and may we all become Buddha soon.